we were in our project globe that kind of suggested to get our head around like uh, actually motivation is another hidden dimension here behind the cultural uh, um, preferences um, to get our head around the nine dimensions on which we can kind of make an initial judgment on preferences and in our seminar we will actually consult a very informed questionnaire survey to figure out our own preferences and see if we have a dominant culture that is relevant to our MSc program or if we have differences. Maybe we have different attributes, preferences, so we can cluster it maybe and then make ambiguous conclusions. No, but uh, um, we, we get a feeling then for, for where we are. We, we kind of arrived at in-group collectivism. What was that again? Do you remember? Yeah, well, let, let's have a football team. Yeah, I like that. So, what what was the uh, uh, collectivism aspect of that? Was it very uh, group collective, uh, in group, or wait, wait, in in group collectivism, or, or was it not? Yeah, kind of. If you dress the same, and you have the same, uh, although this is tricky, right? They have every year a new one. Yeah. So okay, but still kind of the same. Yeah. But as a good fan, is it like perceived that you're a good fan if you buy every year the new one? Or, or is this like kind of like, ooh, I don't know? The colors are the same. Co colors are the same, okay. But otherwise, it doesn't matter too much. So as long as you have one, yeah. Even on an, I, I learned this. I, I was on a, a, a game with uh, some employers that I did research for, and uh, um, they, they had uh, booked uh, um, a, a box, it's called, yeah, a box. Don't be fooled, this is basically a cabin. Uh, 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 it's a balcony out to the actual ranks where you kind of have dinner. Yeah, so they, they, there's a meal, it's really nice. So we were there, and uh, um, as I learned, they, they came in suit, and then they shot a goal, and he opened his shirt, and beneath he had a, a, a strip on. It was quite impressive that I didn't see that coming. <laughs> And, and the other one, there, there was as well another contractor that was from Sunderland, and I was like, oh. uh, so it was very emotional. But uh, a fascinating scenario. Yeah, so and, and they were sitting around the table. This is another important thing. Uh, uh, apparently, he told me that I shouldn't point him out as a Sunderland fan, otherwise he may not make it out of the stadium, depending on the result. Uh, so it got quite serious, but uh, was all fun at that time. So Newcastle won actually six three. It was like an ice hockey game. It was fabulous against Everton. Nobody had believed that at the time. Yeah, but anyway, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, in group collectivism. So well, in, in group collectivism was the idea yeah, that uh, um, we have as well kind of a posing. So we, we don't really question each other. We, we take kind of norms for granted in our network. Yeah? So what, what could that be? What is an example of that? What, what is a light one, uh, maybe? in group collectivism. I mean, football was a good example. You may come from a family, your dad is a football fan of a particular club, and as a child, you, you don't do the critical analysis of available teams. Yeah, it's, it's following. A following. Yeah, so it's, it's a, a, a following. Yeah, So you, you go with a group decision. You wouldn't question. Yeah? Or a very controversial example is, uh, again, Howard Snowden. Uh, um, with a whistleblower, yeah. So you you see that uh, especially in the press, he was deemed as a bad character, yeah. That that means as a in group collectivism. What what he has pointed out, even to the norm standard, was not all right, but he was actually more attacked for uh, um, uh, being the whistleblower than actually recognizing, hey, wait a minute, something is going wrong. Yeah, the contrary of in collective uh, in group collectivism, what's the opposite? There are a few grades where this could go. Okay, we maybe I'll come to that in the questionnaire to, to get a feel for this. This is like a being very critical of each other all the time. Yeah. So that there's always a certain seeking for norms. This is kind of uh, uh, in humans where we prefer normally harmony versus like uh, um, critical content. Yeah? So this is uh, uh, something what people get quite annoyed of uh, after a while. 
Yeah, but there, there's a degree when it becomes so coercive that norms are just accepted without questioning why. Yeah. And, and that is not uh, um, the why, but uh, if, if you feel you cannot even ask why, does that make sense? Yeah, if you uh, uh, still feel like, okay, we, we can ask the question why, then you have at least this healthy uh, kind of dialogue. And you know, then the explanation may solve it for you or not. But uh, in, in group collectivism, you may just accept things because that is how people confront you with it. Yeah? This is kind of the, the edge. But we, we have again questions in the question uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, bring that. What is gender e egalitarianism? Well, what could that be? Well, what do you think? So, like, back in the group thing, like, males was much stick together with females, or whatever. Yeah, so it could be that. Uh, um, you, you could divide gender out into particular roles or, or particular localities. Yeah, where they have to hang out, or it has to do with role allocation in society. Yeah, you have particular roles. Uh, to, to give you a, a beautiful one from Polynesia, the, the old uh, Polynesian I, uh, island inhabitants, the, the women were actually kind of the rulers of the land, while the men had to go hunting and fishing. And they, they had to obey basically to the rules, and they were sleeping in uh, separate hoods even. So uh, if, if they wanted to start a family, then they could say so, and then they got their own hood for a while. But uh, as well, the children were kind of uh, ownership from, from the women. Yeah. So if you're interested in this, yeah, this is uh, quite counterintuitive to, to norms <coughs> that, that you may have experienced around you. Yeah? Anthropology is quite interesting for that. So the women were in charge? Yes, you could say so. <coughs> a bit like my house. Okay, so <laughs> this is so we, we we will figure this out in a second. Yeah, so uh, um, there, there is, is a difference. Yeah, and, and there's a perceived one that is formal. Yeah, so you you may have uh, um, been brought up that way. Yeah, in a school you may have a school that is divided. Uh, um, in one school you have only the boys, in the other school you have only the girls. Or you you have uh, in, in Germany it's the opposite. Yeah, so you you mix them all and. Uh, um, and then force that nobody is allowed to wear uniforms. So it's a very colorful uh, group. Yeah. So th this is as well possible. Yeah. So those are the options in a way. Yeah. And gender egalitarianism means uh, um, it doesn't matter what gender you are. Uh, um, everything has to be done by everything. Yeah? So this means that uh, um, arguably Sweden. Uh, this depends. So in, in vocational traits, for example. Uh, Sweden is uh, um, very egalitarian. So this means on a construction site, the technicians and workers are pretty much women or, or men half-half. Yeah? So it, it's more or less, uh, it doesn't really matter. You will find half-half on site. Yeah? Whereas in other countries, it, it's maybe the opposite. You only find women or you find only men. Yeah? And, and this uh, has often a cultural origin. Yeah? And preferences as well. Yeah? So this is quite interesting. So uh, um, did you have an example for um, uh, where, where gender may become uh, diverse? I know you do have a topic for this. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what was your spin in the topic? Uh, um, you, you know, uh, you, you, are, you, you wanted to look at the gender spin, isn't it? So did you have, uh, um, where, where's your edge or, or where, where do you believe uh, um, gender imbalances may be there? But, but you wanted to look in your country, isn't it? Uh, yeah. and, and what is your feeling? What, what do you think? Uh, uh, do, do you believe it's quite equal or is it very unequal? It's unequal. Okay. It's like, uh, in some terms, only there will be like more female. Mm -hmm. And in some terms, there will be like no at all. Like last time I did my internship in a consultant firm. Yeah. Um, it's more than half is female and just the top manager is male, then for the one who do the measurement thing, the contracting is all female. Then yeah. when I went to the site to attend site meeting, um, the meeting is all 
Okay. Yeah. So interesting dynamics. Yeah. yeah? So you, you have really a, a gender divide. Yeah. In that case. Yeah. And, and this is uh, then a sign that the culture has still, on on side at least, yeah, this uh, uh, gender bias. Yeah. yeah. And uh, th this is kind of where, where it can go. Yeah. The the here's an interesting one. Restaurant chefs, mostly male or female. What do you think? This is just to test our our assumptions here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ay, ay, ay. And, and so in Africa, not? In, in the restaurant or at home? Everywhere, yeah? Yeah, most Like um, for five star hotels, you have males that are like basically the chefs, you know. Okay, so in the kitchen we, we have a mix, yeah, but if you look at chefs, yeah, and, and what we associate with the kitchen is counterintuitive, yeah, it's actually very male dominated, and the joke was always that the, the people that really want to cook, they do it professional, because it's not legitimate to just cook in the kitchen, and you're frowned upon, hey, yeah, you know, there was this gender bias uh, thing. Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so it's not uh, um, always intuitive what I'm saying. Yeah, this, this is important to keep in mind. Yeah, so uh, and, and gender egalitarianism is uh, um, everybody can do the job. Yeah, and everybody uh, is is doing it. So you can see it in statistics. And the opposite is uh, gender bias. It's like when it's leaning towards one. Yeah, when you have gender preferences. What is assertiveness? What what is that? Yeah, so you said esteem, yeah? Uh, uh, I said like positive. Oh, okay. Yeah, positive. So, yeah, well, what does that mean? Positive how? You are very assertive. Yes, well, what does that mean? Yeah, positivity and uncertainty is something. Yeah, yeah, you are very encouraging, yeah? Does, does that make sense? Decisive. Yeah, decisive, yeah. So how, how would we uh, um, have preferences here? What, what does that mean? Strong character. Yeah. Forceful. You use forceful for yeah, could, could go in the direction of forceful. So what what would that be in a in a leadership uh, position? I think this is a good idea. Is that assertive or not so assertive? No, this yeah, is a good idea. This is a good idea. This is what we have to do. Versus, hey, what what about this option? What what do you think? Right. Assertiveness. Yeah, it's different styles. Uh, are you with me? Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, and then future orientation? Well, what is that? What, what do we need that for? Yeah. Vision, direction. Yeah. Where are we going? Yeah, so this, this is kind of what it is, but uh, um, do, do, what, what does it mean in a leadership context? Not so much concerned with them making decisions for now. It's for the big, the, call. Yeah. Yeah. the big picture. Let, let's cash out now. Who knows if the thing is standing tomorrow? Yeah, versus like no, no, no. We we we, de we do need this particular brand that's renowned to be more durable. This will really last us in the future. Yeah, that was the technical example. Yeah, or, or in, in the team. No, don't, don't worry. We, we don't have to finish it today. You you do your training and read up in the books as well. And then to, tomorrow we try again. We we try it slowly to build you up. Yeah. Versus like, no, no, you, you finish this now. That doesn't matter. Just get it done, and then we will pet over it. It's OK. Yeah? Again, horrendous examples here, but uh, you, you get the idea. Yeah? Then perf performance orientation? What, what is that? What can performance orientation mean? Where we can use football as a good example because ironically, who, who's more performance oriented? I make it very controversial now. Uh, the Brazilian team, the English team, or the German team? German, German po performance oriented. Is that true? Brazilians, they play a lot of entertainment way, whereas the Germans seem to have a mentality and just win. They're not really bothered how we play. And then England, no, just yeah. hit in the middle but not going to win. So, I mean, yeah, 
<laughs> but there are three dimensions here. But uh, uh, a performance is basically the uh, um, you focus on on like how you are doing it, yeah, the performing. So you would probably say the English are the best there, because they really have players that are wonderful performers. Yeah, from from the individual skill, I, I would say the English team is probably one of the strongest by far. Yeah. Maybe the Brazilians are close behind, yeah, because with artificial, uh, well, uh, the, uh, I would say uh, they, they have the, they know how to entertain, yeah, it, it's not always on the performance level, but the Germans, I don't know if you have been to a game, most of the time, awful to watch, yeah, the, the, sorry, yes, it's a, a little camera or two, but, uh, uh, but most of the, they, they have wonderful football too, don't, don't they get me this wrong, but uh, um, they, they work more performance oriented as a team. Yeah, but not performance oriented on an individual level. Yeah, if if you do the performance like, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, who's the famous Brazilian Niemeyer? Yeah, versus who was the best German? I guess the goalkeeper. But uh, this is difficult to evaluate. Yeah, a bit best striker? I don't know. If the, the, oh, ambiguous. I don't know. Something like Müller or Götze maybe. Yeah, you, you compare them on the performance level, dribbling skill. Nah. Uh, not comparable. Yeah, so it gets very difficult to to look at the performance and say the Germans had a chance. No, yeah? okay, terrible example. I, I feel the concept that I should take a different. Uh, uh. But performance is basically looking at the individual uh, doing it. Yeah, so bricklaying, you would look at how wonderful it's aligned the brickwork. Yeah, and, and how how straight it is that it doesn't ankle up. And then you know that it's as well, depending on if you wanted a straight line, that it's a straight line, not like a curved one. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so there, there are wonderful things like that. And then you can look at speed as well. Yeah? Something like that. So those are wonderful performance measures. Yeah? So, uh, um, yeah, that, that, that were a few uh, examples. Then we have as well humane orientation. What, what does that What does that mean? Yeah, it's an ethical indicator. Wh which one? Uh, Where does it go? Utility of higher good. So uh, um, if, if you have one that uh, is healthy and you have six people that are unhealthy, you take that one person apart to make the six other ones healthy? Yes. No, that, that was a joke. Yeah, this was an ethical dilemma. Yeah, so. um, yeah, you put people first, aren't you, rather than the job? Yeah, so you, you take their dignity and their, uh, so you, you are respectful basically to their values. Yeah. C can you imagine, so what, what would be a, a no go zone? As a manager, what would be a good example? What would be a bad example? Oh, For the humane orientation. So where, where would we be on the high? Humane uh, uh, orientation yeah, as a manager. Yeah. yeah, like uh, um, a family member is ill at home, and he says like he wants to look after them. Yeah, like that, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no problem. No problem. You don't even have to mention it. Just look after them. Come back when when you are. Yeah. <coughs> let let us know how how long it takes. Something like that, and then you you're off. Yeah, not a problem. Now the op opposite is. You leave, you you are fired. Yeah, so, 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 yeah. So again, quite, quite. So you you have settings to this, yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, um. I have to as well uh, uh, now for the sake of the results, like basically spin out a little bit the generation theory, and uh, uh, here we are with Cooper Schmidt, uh, uh, who really kind of pointed this out. This is kind of a um, old phenomena. Phenomena. If you are really interested in that, again, I can recommend the Greek. Socrates once says, the students have, l uh, well, oh, I gave it away. Sorry, you, you say basically this quote first and then say who said it. But okay, the, the idea is basically that uh, he had already like a kind of an academy, university thing. And he pointed out that uh, in the past, uh, um, people were very respectful, very careful in wording, uh, 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 addressing the lecturer. Yeah? So there was a huge authority thing. So it would be, uh, um, basically raising the arm till you are pointed at and, and then you would speak. Yeah? And uh, um, he pointed out that that has been gone. 
and that was already 500 years before we started our calendar. Yeah? So uh, um, it's quite interesting. The generation thing was always something where a cultural settlement was done yeah? between the uh, older generation and the younger generation. So um, generation is an identifiable group that shares birth years roughly, yeah? age, location, significant life events at critical development uh, develop Blockmental stages. So this this means as well you have kind of the same uh, events around you. What what could be uh, such events? Or what do you think? War. Yeah, war is, is one. Yeah, so those are kind of historic events that really shape my generation. Yeah, revolutions, for example. Yeah. Then as well, a uh, uh, particular maybe uh, positive events, cultural events. Yeah. Uh, so th there are quite a few. So uh, um, in the Netherlands, I have to give you now a little bit of uh, context. So there, there was actually a baby boom. yeah, And uh, um, they, they were quite resistant to change. So they're a little bit uh, conservative to, to new ideas and uh, um, autocratic style. So it, it was quite clear leadership uh, um, kind of uh, um, leads the game. And on Generation X was uh, um, high value technical skills. Um, um, coaches and mentors was preferred. Yeah, so it's very contradictory. Yeah, so here you want somebody that shows you how to do it, and then you want to take more and more ownership. And then you, you add the young generation that kind of came afterwards, uh, less, less motivated by power. So they kind of gave their up to totally and value human interaction and authentic relationships. Yeah, so as well as a leader, you have to probably convince them. Yeah, and they, they will probably want to negotiate with you. Otherwise, it gets uh, um, boring and they may leave. Um, there, there was also the reputation of laziness. Yeah, put minimal effort in to reach the top. Yeah, so this is of course a, a, a dilemma, especially if you have a hierarchy that kind of sets on merit of being outstandingly good, and you give them a task and then here yeah, try that. Yeah, and uh, there, there's not really this kind of uh, um, thriving there. So this was at least what they found empirically. Yeah, and, and this, this uh, is even true for uh, the northwest of Germany, ironically. Yeah? So the, the cultural values were very similar at that time, uh, um, which, which is interesting. Now the Dutch leadership, uh, um, so this is Netherlands uh, uh, kind of specific. But it goes a little bit further. It's as well what Anu kind of found in her research. Uh, so it's a little bit painted. As, uh, um, the valued leadership characteristics were honesty. Yeah? So if, if something is uh, kind of uh, um, set up in a certain way, they, they wanted to hear, OK, we are working towards that. Integrity, so uh, uh, yeah, quite, quite an interesting one. Yeah? So your, your, your word is accounted against. Yeah? Inspirational, so they, they wanted to be kind of taken along. Open communicator, this works well, that doesn't work well, yeah, uh, in, into your face. And then as well, motivator, team builder, and anti-hero. What, what is anti-hero? What, what does that mean? Does that mean you you want a villain, some, somebody that is stupid? Doesn't want to be, yeah. It's, it's team recognition, yeah? You, you want actually to avoid that you have a hero. So if, if there is like an opportunity uh, where, where something doesn't work, you make it a team task to solve it together. You don't want one that steps in and says like, hey, I can do this. Yeah, This is kind of the opposite. Now then, uh, fav favorable leadership style, this is what she uh, um, evaluated, was clearly participative. Now the, the ministry had a huge issue when she actually evaluated them. Um, that there were, I think, three leaders that were doing actually participative styles, and the rest had other ones. Actually, I have the data here. Let's have a look at that. So, uh, um, oh yeah, sorry, a little bit more background. So, uh, um, what, what is infrastructure? Is the road, tunnels, and, and airports as well. So, um, this is uh, um, road, rail, and aviation and water management projects. They basically the whole country is a water management project. If you're interested in that, yeah, it's a, if you look uh, at, uh, um, yeah, so the, the big project that they did is actually the Alpha B project. Yeah, if you Google that, uh, you, you would see it's pretty impressive. It's basically this whole country is kind of actually ocean that have reclaimed that through very smart techniques in engineering. Yeah, so uh, um, 
um, and in particular, management remits of the ministry are public-private partnerships of mega projects mandated by the government and delivered by private contractors. So this is basically the interface for the project managers. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, a lot are, are very high value. Uh, um, characterized as uncertain, uh, often uh, complex, a lot of this stuff is politically sensitive. So as well with uh, um, political parties, certain energy plants, for example, failed. So in the Netherlands, they were as well on nuclear for some time. Then they had to basically abandon that and they had to come up with a new strategy. So it, it's very problematic. Yeah? So sometimes it's out of your hand. You, you kind of have to be in the networks to kind of get the feeling if that is a go ahead or, or it's very likely to fall. And involved in large number of partners. Yeah, so um, often it's contracted out. You probably know it yourself uh, as well from project. And as you can see, a uh, little country, Amsterdam is somewhere here, yeah, there. And then you you have uh, other big cities like Rotterdam, and uh, um, I mean this is really it, right? The other cities nobody nobody knows, right? Oh, well, it's Maastricht maybe for that, uh, maybe as well, but uh, um, then they have a few cities, but it's a small population as well. Yeah? So it's not a very big city, but a, a very uh, um, well-developed infrastructure-wise. Now, uh, um, yeah, she, she used kind of two, two mega projects. One is, uh, uh, um, is the Schiphol Amsterdam Almere Tunnel, so biggest project in the country, uh, six, uh, 63 kilometers road to so roughly, uh, um, what is that, in miles? It's 50 miles, 45 miles, right? Yeah, 40 miles uh, to, to um, reduce congestion problems of this traffic. So you can see there are already uh, um, kind of roads, but they basically are not straight lines. Five separate projects, uh, um, and you can see it's a very long project frame for, for the projects, 12 years. And uh, yeah, last year's well tunnels. Uh, so this is actually what gets interesting. It's underground, in the water, cool stuff. Yeah, as a project manager, this is when you get excited. Yeah. Uh, here, here we are talking like uh, interesting matters. Then uh, um, uh, Süd Willemsfahrt, uh, it's a connection. It, it means basically South uh, um, Wilhelms uh, uh, Harbor, yeah, translated. Uh, um, it's a widening of the channel uh, over 120 uh, um, yeah, 23 kilometers to improve container transport from Rotterdam to the south, which is a line that goes to Germany and France. So it's a major uh, um, shipping uh, 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 transport. Bit. And it's because the ships get bigger, uh, usual, usual game. Uh, uh, one uh, ship can replace uh, 99 trucks on the road, so it's as well to uh, basically take the traffic off the road on, on strategy. Yeah? Time estimation, five years. Yeah? So cool stuff. So she basically, uh, um, but uh, those projects really have kind of a lot of project managers. So just to, to frame the uh, objectives again, identify generational diversity, cultural characteristics, leadership competences, and use of style. Examine the perceptions uh, of good project leadership practice, so evaluating it as well. And then draw conclusions on how generational diversity impacts on project leadership in the sector. And then she has scoped it a little bit, so uh, looking at stakeholder management, contract management, uh, um, uh, what was that? Control and risk, and uh, technical managers. And uh, um, then to evaluate it, the teams. Yeah? So this is who she approached. Quite, quite a thorough study, if you want. Yeah. Uh, um, so there, there was a survey basically with 30, 40 participants. This, those were actually companies. Uh, we, uh, the, there were a lot more interviews behind that. Uh, um, then the uh, um, questionnaire design. I have it here. The short version uh, um, is from Globe Adapted. Yeah. So it's a serum that was proven. And then uh, um, she did another 15 uh, interviews with 15, uh, 15 interviews with uh, further participants to kind of inform the material, yeah, what that means, why they preferred one leadership over the other, and uh, why they may perceive other ones to be uh, very difficult. So the big uh, uh, challenge was really getting access to the right target group. Uh, uh, one contract in the industry resulted in a snowball effect. So in reality, she worked actually with the ministry, and uh, um, the new project wasn't yet bitted out. So suddenly everybody looked very favorable of, of uh, uh, working with her. Yeah? 
And it opened up all the doors. Yeah, so this was quite interesting. Now, uh, um, this is kind of the result. Uh, uh, it spoils it a little bit, but uh, um, we go through it anyway. So this was quite interesting. The Dutch values are credibility, honesty, and integrity as, as the most thing, which means that basically that there's a lot of gambling going on, and you are really looking for the ones that are actually credible, honest, and uh, uh, have the integrity. Um, most important leadership competences were results orientation, having perspective, uh, um, so the overview as well, and uh, delegation, so being actually capable to lead it. Um, now, there, there were differences or, or preferences, but the interesting thing is that uh, uh, um, it, it didn't really stay dominant. So the baby boomers did prefer transactional. What was transactional again? Yeah. So basically, this is the generation born between the 50s and uh, 60s. 65, actually. Yeah, the, those are the baby boomers. They prefer a uh, um, kind of reward for task achieved. Yeah, you get the task given, you, you do it, and in exchange, you, you get rewarded. Yeah? Maybe paid. Now, Generation X uh, is directive. What, what does that mean? What was directive again? It's, it's a vision. Yeah, and, and then you go for it. Yeah, and and if, if you then have support mechanisms, uh, it, it has to be by incentivizing. Yeah, or, or by by showing you're know, getting off track here. Uh, uh, if you're doing better, I, I pay you maybe a little bit more. Yeah, and with the uh, younger generation, so the most recent one, uh, um, it was actually transformational, which is quite uh, surprising. Yeah. So, uh, main findings, similar uh, similarities found between generations and organizations, differences between more and less experienced group, and small group found between use of leadership uh, uh, project managers and needs for team members, which is uh, quite interesting. Now, uh, um, this is kind of the setting for the Dutch company, uh, uh, for, for the Netherlands, of the infrastructure ministry and like relating partners. But now comes, of course, the cool stuff. Uh, uh, we have to figure out ourselves where we are. And yeah, this is it. Who are? Okay. okay, so this is a, a leadership style questioner. What type of uh, um, a leadership style do you prefer? Uh, uh, please take one and uh, uh, hand the rest on. And then you can read through it and uh, give it a shot. It's as well written on the back uh, um, how to evaluate this. Yeah. Uh. Shall Shall we read one through it that we understand all the questions? That, does it make? Do you know how to do it? Possible. Oh, Thank you. <coughs> Okay, I'll open it up anyway. Okay, so it's a Likert scale, yeah? Uh, um, so basically the question here, what we try to figure out, leadership style, uh, uh, what type of leadership style do you prefer? It's the ones that we kind of had presented briefly in this uh, um, session. And uh, the Likert scale is basically the following. You have here the numbers from one to seven. Um, if you, for example, the project manager explains details about the project task and defines project goals and where you're going, and you, you uh, um, think that is strongly undesirable, uh, it's too much detail, <coughs> who needs this? Then, then you, you make a one, yeah? you, you circle the one. If you think this is strongly desirable, I, I want to understand the goals, then you circle the seven. Yeah? And that you can go, of course, for everything in between. Does that make sense? Did you have a question? Oh, okay. The, uh, um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Then, then go for it. Work, work it uh, uh, once through, and then we we see where we all arrive.